we discussed uh, briefly about verse 11, so let's expand upon it just a little bit more. The Bible reads here, put on the whole armor of God. So the Bible says that you have to put on the whole, the entirety of the armor of God, not just parts of it. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, so that you can be able to stand against Satan's tricks, his deceptions, wiles, traps. That's what wiles is referring to. So remember, this is literally word for word, verse by verse explanation of this verse by verse Bible study. So that's the goal. That's the intention. So try to pay attention and try to interpret yourself every word from the verse. That way you can improve your own knowledge of the scriptures. So understanding this full text, it is important that from the word of God, we put on the entirety, the wholeness of the armor of God, because any missing area that you give is enough where the enemy will be able to take advantage of you and find an opening. So you don't want to give an opening to the wicked one. So make sure that you arm yourself wholly. So whole and armed. Because the devil, he looks at the weak spot better than you can sometimes. Because sometimes you blind yourself out of too much pride and stubbornness. So then the devil, he sees your weak areas better than you. So if you don't look at your weak areas to arm yourself, you better know this as Satan was probably years ago saw that and kept hitting you in that area. It's only by the grace of God you're still alive. So it is important to arm yourself in every area. Now, it says tricks, wiles, deception, traps of the devil because we're wrestling against his entirety, the entirety of his system. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So our wrestling, our match, our fight is not physical warfare, flesh and blood. It's not humans themselves, but against principalities. So notice that the principalities, the dominions of this place, against powers, so powerful forces, powerful entities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So there are rulers in this world, people who are set in charge over the darkness that Satan has set up in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now that's referring to devils against, notice, spiritual wickedness. See that? So it's spiritual entity, spiritual evil that's found in high places. So notice that devils, that they are attracted to high areas. Now for some of you who don't know about the history, that's why Korea, it had shamanism for over a millennium before Buddhism came to the scene. And shamanism, they took mountains very seriously because they believe that's where great spirits or huge spirits lie within the power of someplace high. And then Buddhism combined with that, and that's the reason why so-called fake Christianity in Korea today who adopted charismatic doctrines because the charismatic doctrines coincidentally matched up well with the shamanistic Buddhist beliefs in Korea. So then that's why they have these prayer mountains, they would call it. You wonder why they got that. You thought that they would be very spiritual. But no, actually it comes from a history where, of sh where they adopted from their ancestors from shamanism and Buddhism. Now obviously, look, there's nothing wrong with praying at a mountain. But Korea's case with Christianity, it's not something that you can just follow their system so easily. Their system uh, was born from this pagan practice a long time ago. So you've got to understand that fact. Now, if we look at this text, we can see that this is not human flesh. But then you'll notice some parts here that there's no doubt human flesh is involved in this spiritual powers, in these spiritual dark forces. For example, it says principalities. Uh, it says rulers of the darkness of this world. So there's no doubt that spiritual dark forces, that they empower some physical rulers in the devil's world. So then, 
is there a contradiction here? Verse 12, it says we're not fighting against uh, physical forces, but then it seems like the latter part of verse 12, there are physical forces involved. Well, the simple answer is this, is see, when you're battling against uh, the popes, the Jesuit order, the professors in this school, uh, you got to be careful, especially with false prophets. And uh, in my case, some of you have known, if you've subscribed for years, how there were some false prophets online who attacked us for a long time. But it's got to be understood that the main enemies are actually not those people. But they are still part of a spiritual wicked force that you have to fight against. That's the point. The point is, is that you're not battling some poor Catholic or Muslim, wicked or lost they may be. They're just deceived by the wicked one, including false prophets. They're deceived. It's not those peoples because those peoples, we want their souls to be saved. Uh, false prophets, I might kick them hard, but to be quite honest, I'd rather that they repent rather than get judged. So that's how the Lord tests your heart if you're truly... Um, have the right spirit when you're battling against your enemies. Now, uh, returning to the main pointer here, so then it's not the people, it's the system you have to understand. That's the key. The key is the reason why we're still battling against physical forces, even though we're technically not, so to speak. The idea is we're battling against the system that's using these physical people who are simply chess pieces and objects. So they're objects. They're not the tools behind the scenery. The evil force is moving. It's this one right here, the spiritual plane. It's a spiritual warfare that you have to see. It's a system. You know, to be quite honest, I don't hate Catholics, but I hate their system. That's the idea. And you should too. You should hate their system because... I mean, you should rejoice when you sing Babylon is Fallen. Amen. If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, unless uh, you're a Christian that goes, Oh, uh, I can't believe you actually rejoice about the Catholic Church burning. I mean, how dare you? I mean, what lack of love? No, I should hate it because if I really love those souls who are going to be deceived and burning in hell because of their system, I should hate their system. It's a wicked, evil system. It has blinded and deceived and damned uh, over a billion Catholic souls into hell, which is sad. It's very sad. Millions of Catholics. Now, understanding that it's a system that we're battling against, that's why you realize you have to be fully armed. Because think about his system. Satan, his system consists of so many dark forces, and you're actually against the minority. Uh, you're actually against the majority here. It's a huge system of Satan that you're battling against. Several factors that can be considered. And uh, I would recommend watching the video, History of Bible Believers. And you'll see more of the spiritual warfare behind it. But some of them where I demonstrated was definitely, and a lot of the onlineers would probably know this, but look at the top globalists today. So there is no doubt some big elites behind the scenes who take advantage and through taking advantage, they control systems in the world. But, th but that's just part of it. Then you got so many false religions around the world and churches, damning literally billions of souls into hell. Then you get Hollywood. Hollywood has brainwashed our generation, and that's where they learn their worldly language, worldly dressing, worldly thinking, etc., and not only that, you're up against the education school system. I mean, it's because of the education school system that they can be able to brainwash the next generations where Christians and even pastors feel incompatible to battle against because they're not as smart. You shouldn't flinch against this system. You have to fight. You have to battle. That's why I've been doing here at Berkeley. Some Christians uh, and pastors and churches, they're thinking only about their own little terrain, and that's false. we got to realize that it's a whole world out there we have to battle against. Amen. It's a whole world out there that we have to battle against. So education. Not only that, you're against the government. Now, I don't mean, obviously, rebellion, and I've already given a lesson on that on the previous Ephesian study, 
But the idea is this, is that there is going to be times where government is going to make you disobey God. At that time, we have to obey God rather than men. Not only that, uh, we don't have to rebel against the government while the government is deceiving us. See, so the government, they might claim certain uh, things that they believe people should follow or that they would recommend or have people to do or try to promote and send your taxes to support the public school system and then presidents and then governmental leaders tolerating uh, sodomites and LGBTQ, X, Y, and Z and all the colors of zebras and animals and giraffes in their zoo. So they teach that kind of manner and you as a Christian don't have to rebel against the government, but you don't have to listen to them either. Amen. That's the idea. You don't have to listen and believe, oh, what they say is true. See, you can still follow and be a good citizen at the government system without conceding, without giving into their propaganda that they're, cra uh, that they're cramming down your throats. So in that sense, we're against the governments of this world that you have to watch out for. So notice that we're a total minority, and not only that, this is something that some people don't understand. It's your fellow Christians. Oh, yeah. Now, the idea is this, is that fellow Christians, if we look at a case at the book of Thessalonians, there might be a brother that we don't count as an enemy, but we still have to separate ourselves from that brother. Uh, there are plenty of passages, Romans 16 and then Corinthians, where it talks about, say, brethren, that we have to separate from. Why? Because Christians have fallen into this system. You see that? That's why we can't really think as the individual, as the person, as our real enemy. I mean, think about it. There's a lot of false pastors out there that I kick and expose who are saved. Shocking, right? Some, some onliners might be shocked about that. There are some false pastors out there that I can give the benefit of the doubt that are saved people. Might not be a lot, so I'll take back on what I just said about that one. But there is a good amount. You'd be surprised. Why? They just compromise. That's their problem. So because they compromise, I have to battle their system. By the way, some people don't know this, but the system that I battle against the most is not this one. It's actually this one. I believe this is the number one. Uh, group of people that the devil has used their system to mess up our world. You might say, why? Because if these people didn't mess up, we could have had a fighting chance. But because they messed up, that's uh, the greatest uh, enemy that I see as a system is the neo-evangelical movement, non-denominational movement, that charismatic movement, that bunch. That's my number one enemy. Because, uh, they've, because they produce this weak sheep, and that's why these guys were able to eat them up. See how many of their people were eaten up by this system. Now, it's true. It's inevitable in every church that you're going to lose some people to the devil's system because no one's perfect. But if you look at the false churches, they're way more. They more than triple the amount compared to Bible-believing churches. Okay, so this is a big world. That's the reason why some of these uh, preachers' names, they could even preach good stuff, but I don't condone them. Why? Because of their system. Some of them are tied to Calvinists. So then you get like, I mean, sure, I appreciate the deeds of John MacArthur, for example, during the time of last year, but uh, he ain't my best friend, and I ain't going to recommend his stuff. Why? Because of the system he's involved with. What? Modern Bible versions. Galvanism. John Piper's the same. R.C. Sproul's the same. And uh, Ray Comfort, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, agree with, fully with Calvinism, but he's uh, very sympathetic toward them. Todd Frio from Wretched, etc. Paul Washer, oh, Paul Washer's bad. <laughs> Paul Washer's really bad. Now, going back to our main text, otherwise I will not finish Ephesians, so let's finish this quickly. So this is a huge system we're battling against. Verse 13, wherefore, so Paul says, that's why, take unto you the whole armor of God. He repeated it twice, 11 and 13. Why? You're not looking at this wicked system we're battling. This is a huge system. Do you realize how small we are? And do you realize how much work there is to do? That's one of the reasons why I went online. One of the reasons why I went online is because I have to spread something that can attack this wicked system all around our world. It's really huge, the enemies around us. And it's a spiritual warfare. 
So that's why you have to be fully armed. San Jose Bible Baptist Church, there's going to be, a, uh, I've, your pastor told you this several times, but remember that Satan is currently trying to find a weak spot in us. And then we've been through a lot of battles, and some of you are going through personal sufferings together, but it's because we're up against a huge system. We've, uh, we've grabbed the lion's tail, so to speak. So obviously the lion's going to bite back. Uh, continuing reading on. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. That way you can withstand. That way you can be able to hold it out and stand during the evil day. So remember, we are in evil times. These are evil days. So we, that's why we have to be fully armed. Now, the Bible repeats again, and having done all, so after you do everything you could to withstand against the enemy, what do you do? Relax? No, to stand. <laughs> Stand. So <clears throat> notice here that verse 13 says you have to stand in the evil day. And after you do everything you could, then after that, stand again. And then notice that it says stand again at verse 11. See that? And Paul just won't shut up at verse 13 after he says after you do everything, then stand again. And verse 14, stand therefore. <laughs> now, this is your problem, Christians, is that uh, your problem is it's not that uh, I need more blessing, I need more grace, uh, I need God to intervene more. No, you need to stand more. That is your problem, is your weakness. We live in a very sissified generation. The Bible has repeated approximately four times that we have seen that we have to stand. Why? Because if you don't stand, then the enemy is going to consume you. You have to stand. When's the last time you stood? Or you just want to get a piggyback from Jesus all the time. You have to stand. It's not that the Lord Jesus Christ, he can't uplift your, uh, he can't give you grace or help you through the trial or even relieve you of your burden. He can, but a lot of times the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, look, you do have the strength and the ability to be able to stand. And if you don't ever stand at all, you're never going to walk, baby child. I mean, you're going to let a baby be uh, crippled for life, so to speak, I guess, never walk? No, there's a time where even a baby Christian has to practice walking and standing on his or her own two feet. Stand. It is so important to stand. You know, there was a story that Dr. Upman said that would put a person under conviction. But there was an English soldier during World War II who was afraid of the battle because the... The uh, Battle of World War II was just bloody and horrendous. Uh, if you look at World War I, it was much worse, but World War II it was still nevertheless a hor time of, filled with horror. So at a time filled with horror, the English soldier uh, ran for the bushes and hid himself, and then he waited and he waited, and then he saw this Nazi soldier just screaming and bleeding and then fighting for his life, and then uh, he fell down at the ground dying. And then the English soldier just stayed there. The, the Nazi soldier just stayed there lying and bleeding and dying. And then you know what happened? That Nazi soldier, he just picked himself back up again out of delirium or something, reported his name, rank, and number, and then he gave a siege hile like that, and then he fell down again and died. Now, what, what's that supposed to mean? That shows that a person who's an unbeliever, who's part of the devil's system, one of the worst systems that you can think of during that time period, that he was able to stand for his master. That's right. You can't do yours. Good, Getting quiet in here. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's continue on, lest I put people under conviction. At verse 14, at verse 14, so you have to stand, having your loins girt about with truth. So, uh, when you stand for the Lord, here are several parts of the armor that you want to know. The first one is the belt of truth. The belt, the belt of truth. So this is found at uh, verse 14, obviously. So let's look at which parts in your armor have chinks in it. Or which parts of your armor that you need to, that you need to strengthen even more. The belt of truth. Why? Because the strength of a man is obviously in his loins. So that's where the strength of a man's lie. A strength of a man lies. If you attack that one, then the man just goes kaput, so to speak. But the idea is this. Greater strength would lie within a frank, honest person. 
who is filled with dependability. The idea is this, is that how can God trust a person if a person lives his life not as a frank, honest person? A person always makes excuses, for example, right? Well, Lord, I can't do this for you because of blah, 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 blah. No, you're just not, you're just being dishonest. You know deep down inside your heart you can do that thing for the Lord, that you can face that battle, but you're just making up a dis, uh, you're just being dishonest and then giving an excuse to God. If you're being truly honest about it, there is something in there that you can conquer the trial and that you can do for the Lord. That's good, brother. So stop making excuses that you can't read your Bible, you can't pray, you can't come to church, you can't win a soul, and et cetera, et cetera. Now look, I don't want to beat down people. Sometimes people can be overtly sensitive. As the generation passed by, I have to explain even more and waste more time in Bible study, and I can't continue onwards. So there are sometimes people who are genuinely sick and then bedridden. There's nothing you can do about it. So you know what I mean, all right? Sometimes people have legitimate excuses. But if you, look, if you start being truly honest with yourself, see that? If you're being truly truthful to yourself, then you know there's something that you could have done better, perhaps. The next one is the breastplate of righteousness, if you look at verse 14. It says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So you have to put on righteousness, and that's your breastplate. Now, if you might recall, we're going to look at some passages here. If we return to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, notice what the Bible says. Because the reason why is we're putting on the old man quite often, even though we shouldn't. The old man, the flesh is dead to us. We should be putting on rather than sin, but on righteousness. So you have righteousness within your spiritual nature. You do have it, but do you put it on? It's like you have your clothes, but do you put it on? That's the idea. So do you put on, do you actually put it on yourself? No, a lot of times you have righteousness, but a lot of times you try to put on the world, don't you? Or the flesh. Notice that the Bible says at verse 24, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what you've got to be doing. All right, going to Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter 6, and then we'll look at verse 15. Ephesians chapter 6, and then we'll read verse 15. It says, and your feet shod. So what is the word shod? Shod is basically putting on your shoes. So believe it or not, shod is easier to use than the word putting on your shoes. If you go putting on your shoes, that's several words. But if you go uh, shod, then that automatically means putting on your shoes. You didn't know that, right? That word is specifically used for putting on shoes, actually. So all you have to do is tell your child shod, and then they'll go all right, you don't have to say, put on your shoes, you know, you just, waste, you just waste time and energy with this one. Sometimes the King James Bible language is easier than modern versions, isn't it? Amen. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Go to Romans 10, Romans 10. So then you have to have your feet putting on shod the gospel of peace, shoes or what they call gospel shoes, gospel shoes. Why is that? It says in preparation, you know that? In preparation when you use the gospel. Because basically everywhere your feet goes, you're going to encounter souls that you have to be ready on the spot to witness to souls. That's why we do soul winning classes, right? That's why our church practices soul winning classes. I'm very proud where about a third of you uh, have an idea how to do soul winning now or can do soul winning. This makes your pastor very happy. you got to realize a lot of Bible-believing churches don't have that kind of benefit. So a third of the members doing that uh, makes me very happy. And why is that? Because your pastor can't be next to you if you encounter a family or a loved one who's dying right beside you at that moment. And you're going to have to be the one that at that moment, at that time, instantly, wherever you're going, you're ready to give the gospel to that person. Notice that the word of God says in Romans chapter 10, and then we'll read verse 
15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful, uh, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. See that? Everywhere you go, your shoes got to, uh, you got to be ready to give the gospel. All right, going back to Ephesians chapter 6, the next part is the shield of faith. Shield of faith. Why is that? The reason why is because what helps you through the storms is basically where you have faith, you believe in God, right? When you go through trials, what helps you quite often? Believing, right? Believing that the Lord will make a way. Believing Romans 8, 28 is true. Believing that the Lord will turn the trial for good. Believing that God's way is better than your way. That's why you give up your plans. You give up your abandonment of your own ways. You give up your worries and burdens and you dump it all to the Lord. Why? That's complete faith. When the devil attacks you, go to Ephesians chapter 6 again and then notice at verse 16, above all. Now, isn't that important? So notice that above, so it seems to imply that above everything in your armor, there's something that's extremely important. Taking the shield of faith. Why? Because this is your only defensive weapon, the most effective defensive weapon against the attacks from the enemy. It reflects it off. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Meaning that this shield of faith, wherewith, that uh, in which, what it can do, you will be able to stop quench all the fiery darts so th there are darts that satan throws at you i don't know if you knew that you might say why is that because he sees a weak area that's hard to see that you're having a hard time seeing and then he uh, it's like a game of darts that he has to hit that bullseye and he's been doing it for what six thousand years so he's a pretty good shot i think yeah. so you got to realize that this is the kind of warfare that you're facing and that you have to be ready you have to be ready and prepared so that it can stop the fiery darts of the wicked so that it don't hit you once you get hit by that then guess what you burn and when you burn some of some of the people are going to go how can you be deceived by that false pastor out there how did you end up where uh you don't attend a bible believing church anymore you used to be the one winning souls you used to be the one with the stellar church attendance you know what I mean, church? Some of you have seen these kind of people in church and you wonder what happened. How, uh, that's, um, uh, that's impossible. How would that happen? You know why? Because Satan got them somewhere where they didn't have faith. Where he was trying to hit their weak area that they didn't see themselves. All right. Going back. <clears throat> the Bible says, and take the helmet of salvation. So you have to have a helmet protecting your head and it's got to be salvation. You might say, why? Because if you lose your leg or arm in battle, you can still survive, but not your head. Not your head. Now, there are uh, two possible applications to this meaning here. So some people might say, is the helmet of salvation referring to our salvation? It could be referring to if you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, you are protecting yourself. Why? Because the head... Now, remember, who's the head of the body of Christ? Jesus Christ, right? Yes. So in order for the body of Christ to function, the head has to be protected. So with salvation, basically with salvation in Jesus Christ, the body of Christ can still function. So the, de the devil can't destroy that. He can't kill the whole body. He might cut off arms and legs and try to injure them and slow it down. But the head, once that's out, then there is no body. It cannot function. So that could be one. It could be one. But it seems like that Paul is saying that saved Christians have to put this on. So in other words, these are already saved Christians, and they have to have the practice of putting it on. So does that mean that they get saved again? No, it doesn't mean, mean that they get saved again, because salvation means to be simply saved from. If you look at, uh, it's like the same thing with condemnation, judgment, damnation. Not all the time do those words refer to burning in hell. It, the word simply means as it says. The Bible makes it that simple. It's not complicated. What does judgment mean? To burn in hell. No, it means to judge you. <laughs> like to punish you. 
Same thing with condemn. It doesn't mean to burn in hell. Condemn means to, uh, the condemn means is to punish you, to find you guilty of something that you did wrong and that you pay for it. Same thing with salvation. What does it mean? Oh, that I go to heaven, that I get saved from hell. No, it just simply means to be saved from, to be saved from. So it could be in the sense that, see, the idea is, then this is more important than you think, the helmet of salvation, is basically, if that's what that means, then if you don't put on your helmet, Satan, he sees that weak spot, which is your head, and all it takes is one shot right in your head, and then you just kill your whole Christian life. And Christian testimony cannot be picked up again. Uh, ministers who went through a dark scandal, pretty much permanent, they can't pick that up again. They ruin it. See, so that's the reason why you have to put on that helmet that saves you from ruining your whole work and testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. It could be in that sense. So there are two possible applications. Second part, uh, verse 17 uh, verse 17, the second part, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the last part that you want to have in your armor is the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? It says, which is the Word of God. So the idea is we have to realize how important it is, which people take it lightly, is having a perfect Bible in your hand. How can you have 200 plus Bibles not believing that every word is perfect and then you have no offensive weapon against your enemy? It's no wonder that uh, modern version scholars and proponents like uh, Dan Walnuts and John Enkelbaum and Judas White and all these uh, wicked evil people who try to make you deny a perfect Bible in your hands that these people and the pastors and churches who, uh, who don't teach a perfect Bible in your hands, no wonder they can't attack the gates of hell. They're not the ones we can depend upon, right? It's us, the Bible believers. Why? Because we believe a perfect word of God in our hands. We're the only ones, only ones with the only offensive weapon. Look at your whole armor here. That's the only offensive weapon. Everything is protection. That's your only offensive weapon to attack this. Your only one, the Bible. The Bible is more than sufficient. What have you learned? Uh, if there's one thing you better have learned from your pastor so far, is that everything that you've learned in Bible class, in preaching, in soul winning training, and everything is from the Bible. Amen. That's everything. Rich, uh, even the, as I cover current events, or even history, or I use science to defend Christian beliefs, it all have to be based on the Bible. If it's not based on Bible, all of that is just uh, entertainment and fluff. Okay, going back. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So the Bible says you have to pray always, not sometimes, every single time, with every prayer that you can. And every supplication. So supplication is obviously to give your request to the Lord. And where the Lord answers it. And that's all done in the Spirit. This is all done through the power of the Holy Spirit. So in prayer life, this is one of the greatest verses in prayer, in spiritual warfare. Okay? So one of the important things that you want to know concerning about spiritual warfare is that prayer is a must. Prayer is a must. Prayer in spiritual warfare is so important because prayer is one of those important things that is powerful against the gates of hell. Why? Because it's not relying on your own strength. It's God's right here. You're relying on God here to overpower the gates of hell. And when you're going against all the entirety of his evil system, you need to not just pray. You need to do all prayer. Now, some of you are going through a spiritual battle right now, then are you doing all prayer and not just praying? Are you doing all prayer? I mean, are you looking at every weak area that the darts are aiming towards? Did you really self-reflect? Did you really look at the situation? And not just yourself, other people around you, the weak areas that the devil is throwing darts. And by praying on those weak areas, 
then perhaps you can see your life improving after that or the trials uh, becoming uh, more relieved after that. So you have to do all prayer. You have to, a lot of times, uh, even when I go through trials and sufferings, nearly every time, I would always change my prayer. It's not the same. It would always change. I would use the same things that worked or has helped me in my life, but I, was, I would always change. You know why? Because there's always something that the Lord's teaching me or wants me to do. So you have to do all prayer. Uh, with all prayer and supplication, I get, see that's the same thing. I'm giving my request to the Lord. Everything that I can request from the Father. Look, if there's anything that I need from God, it's anything He has in heaven, I want it. Oh, I just need a little bit. No, I want everything that He's got. All right, I'm that selfish. So any, um, uh, any treasure house of grace, mercy, uh, or God uh, teaching me a lesson or whatever, I need it. Good, brother. I need that. I'm not, I'm not that strong, even though you might think you're strong. I'm not that strong. I need all of him, not nothing of myself. Now, understanding that uh, we have to be praying, then this shows that there's no armor for the knees. Notice this is shoes of gospel and then belt of truth, but there's so much of a weak area on your knees. Why is that? Why is that open space there? Because you're kneeling on the ground. When you're kneeling on the ground, then so to speak, when you're kneeling on the ground, that's why there's no armor there, so that you can kneel. And that when the devil is shooting those darts at you, that's when you better dodge even lower. Yeah. And you better dodge lower. And then, you, I mean, you're at that desperation, right? That de you, you've seen those desperate prayers? You're just flat on the ground like that and you're crying. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you need to do. You need to go so low. That way it's harder for that enemy to find you, to find an open space. Especially when you're surrounded through prayer, it's harder. It's harder. But there is spiritual warfare in prayer. You've got to understand that. When you're praying, Satan is going to prevent the answer. He's going to try to uh, hinder you. So go to the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel. It is a spiritual warfare and you have to fight. Look at the book of Daniel. And then we'll look at chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Now notice that Daniel, as he was praying, he was praying for three whole weeks. And it seemed like that there was no intercession, no answer. But the angelic be being told him that, no, I did hear your prayer, but I was battling against Satan. So the prince of Persia withstood me. So Daniel chapter 10, verse 3, the Bible says, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now go down at verse 12. Then said he, the angelic being, unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. See, it was Satan. Okay, going back. Uh, actually, turn your other hands to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. While you're turning to Matthew 27, let me read the next part of Ephesians 6 and verse 18. The next part reads, And watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. Notice that what accompanies prayer is watching. You have to be watchful. You have to be observant. That's why I mentioned about in prayer, you're self-reflecting. And not just self-reflecting on your own weak areas, watching and observing your own weak areas, taking notice, but other people too. Notice this is watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. It's for everybody else too. You have to pray for your pastor. You have to pray for the pastor's wife, the pastor's children. You have to pray for the leaders who are teaching in the pastor's church. You have to pray for the newcomers who come to the church, etc., etc. You have to pray for all, notice it says all saints, not people who you like. Okay? 
not for people who you like. That's, and if it's the person that you don't like that the devil will attack, obviously, then. Why? To build up that dissension even more, obviously. That might preach a little bit. But going to verse 18, it says that when you're doing the watching, it's done with all perseverance. So you have to persevere. And you have to use every ounce of your perseverance and strength and being. See, it's, it is perseverance when you pray. All perseverance and supplication. Again, you have to give every supplication, every request that you can give to the Lord for yourself and for everybody. So watching and praying go hand in hand in spiritual warfare. That is so important. If you pray and you don't watch, then a lot of the prayers is just probably even vain repetition. Sometimes you have to ask yourself that. And then if you're watching but not praying, you're going to be a paranoid freak. Good, All right, go to Matthew chapter 27. Uh, Matthew 26, excuse me, Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, watch and pray that he enter not into temptation. See, Satan was the one that let get them to fall. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, going back, Ephesians 6, 19. Ephesians 6, 19. And for me, so Paul is continuing on prayer at verse 18, right? For me, I want you to pray for me on what? That utterance may be given to me. So that he can utter, so that he can speak. He can have the speech given to him from God. On what? That I may open my mouth boldly. So that he can open his mouth boldly. Not be afraid. Why? Because uh, he's in prison, in chains. And he has to be bold when he speaks out against the governmental leaders on his faith. I mean, the Jews want to kill him. Keep reading, to make known the mystery of the gospel. See that? So he, he wants to proclaim the gospel, not compromise. He wants to make known the gospel. Now notice it says mystery of the gospel. Why is that? Because obviously uh, Paul was given the mystery. We've read that at chapter 3. We read that at chapter 3. So the gospel is a mystery. So this was given to Paul. So Paul, he had to be bold in speaking out about that. So it doesn't matter how many anti-dispensationalists or people who want to tie you to the Mosaic Law on Sabbath and they try to badmouth Paul. I mean, Muslims do that too. They, they'll leave Jesus alone, but they badmouth Paul because they know Paul's doctrines fully contradict theirs. So despite of how many people might badmouth about Paul, uh, the, uh, we have to be bold about Paul's gospel. It is the right gospel. Uh, you don't go to any other passages in the scripture that contradict. You have to be bold about it. All right, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. See that? So because he's in bonds, he's in prison. Uh, that's why he has to be bold. But he's an ambassador. The gospel, when you're, a, when you're showing the gospel, you're an ambassador. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, it doesn't matter who you are, man, woman, and child, you are already an ambassador for heaven. Now, if ambassadors in this secular world take their job so seriously in their dressing, and how they appear in the eyes of the world, in their demeanor, and uh, how they represent their own country and their leader, it's a crying shame how Christians do that in today's churches. So that's the reason why we have to be ser serious ambassadors. When you're, do you not realize when you're giving out a track, you're actually being an ambassador for Jesus? When you're mentioned about Jesus or when you pray, even when you pray, backslidden Christians, I know some of them would even pray before they eat. Even when you're praying, I mean, you're representing, you're showing Jesus Christ to the world. When you're giving the gospel to people, you're automatically considered an ambassador. Take that seriously. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what the Bible says at verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. See, we have that word of the reconciling gospel now then we are ambassadors for christ we pray you in christ's stead be reconciled to god see that 
All right, go to Ephesians chapter 6. So you're automatically considered an ambassador when you give them the gospel about, hey, be reconciled to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, uh, at the last part of verse 20, that therein I may speak boldly, so, he, so that he can speak boldly despite of being in chains, as I ought to speak, as he ought to speak. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you're giving the gospel like Joel Osteen does, you're doing it wrong. Oh, he gives gospel when he does a prayer at the end. Do you know how many people have no idea and they just repeat the prayer and they have no idea at all when Joel Osteen does that? Uh, Ray Comfort is one of the worst people. He tries to give the gospel so clearly and carefully and then he doesn't even give them the opportunity to the sinner's prayer and let them go. I mean, that's, I don't know what's worse, you know? So the point is this, is that it's, uh, when you're doing the gospel, it's got to be done right. You got to speak it the way it ought to be spoke. Doing it Ray Comfort's way, is, uh, that is a waste of time. Because when you're giving the gospel, you can't just give the gospel. It's got to be done the way you ought to speak. Uh, some of these street preachers who are actually big jerks, you know, they try to attract attention through shock messages. So then they'll have like a sign, Q-U-E-E-R-S. And then it, I'll be honest, you know, when you read that, you kind of laugh at that because you're just fleshy and you're just full, you know, you're just full of flesh, you know. But then uh, they use that to attract and garner attention so that what? They can preach their gospel to these people. No, that's not how it's done. It's got to be done ought to speak. What is it that you ought to speak? It's through the word of God. It's done through the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, right? And hearing by the what? Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Now look, there are certain ways that you can uh, build up a crowd, and I do the same thing too in soul winning, and hey, let's be honest, even online too. But the idea is this, is that when you give the gospel, it's got to be done the way that you ought to speak. It's got to be done in that manner. If the gospel is not presented rightly, all right, you can use any tactic you want to present the gospel rightly, but don't use any tactic that you want where it presents the gospel wrongly. That's the idea. You have to preach about hell. Uh, where did Joel Osteen mention about that? I mean, give them the opportunity to confess it before the Lord. Don't just talk about hell and repentance, Ray Comfort. I mean, see, that's the idea. You get a, a total off balance of both worlds. You got to uh, speak it the way it ought to be spoken, the gospel. So when you do street preaching, check your hearts. Are you doing it the way it ought to be spoken? When you're uh, knocking on doors, are you speaking the way it ought to be spoken? And when you preach on the pulpit, don't you dare compromise. Are you preaching the way it ought to be spoken? That's the idea. Okay, going back, going back. Our missionaries, amen? Are they going to give the gospel as it ought to be spoken? Amen? That's all what it's about. The whole idea of missions, churches, and even individual people is to give the gospel amen. to the people. And it's got to be done the right, uh, rightly. Okay, let's look at uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And then we'll look at verse 21. But that he also may know my affairs. And so Paul says, uh, when he talks about himself in prison status in bonds, he says, I'm also trying to let you know about my affair, my status right now. So it's like reading missionary reports, right? <laughs> That's the idea. So if there's a scripture verse you want to use about, uh, give me a verse in the Bible that missionary reports are right or biblical, you can use this one, okay? So notice that as an ambassador, right, 20, as an ambassador, that's the idea. Same thing with missionaries. So, so uh, that you may know my affairs and how I do so that the people can know how he's doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. So there's a beloved brother. And this minister and this guy is faithful, ministering for the Lord. So it's not just Paul's affairs, Tychicus's affairs, shall make known to you all things. So then Paul sends out Tychicus where he makes sure that he makes known to the church everything that he's doing. Uh, it is important, to be quite honest, I think it is biblical. It is uh, biblical and it is important where members know about the status of the people, important people delivering the gospel. You might say, why is that important? That way they can know what's going on, and that way they can follow along verse 18 and 19. Why were they able to pray for that missionary Paul? 
Why were they able to pray for him on that specific request that he wanted? Because he gave them his missionary report, so to speak. Does that make sense? So see, that's why this is important. So it is important where uh, you give reports to the people. This pastor would too, sometimes to onliners or more so to this church because more, more of it is private to our church. But I would tell you, right? Some of you even heard some of the uh, stuff that I held for a long time and uh, I had to give it to you at the right timing. Why? Because it's important. That way I could use your prayers and we can be in warfare together. We know what to do. Okay, reading onward. Verse 22, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that ye might know our affairs. So Paul repeats again that that's why he sent out Tychicus to them based on that same purpose, that they can know his affairs and that he might comfort your heart so that he might comfort them. Usually reports should be comforting to the people as well. Sometimes, uh, uh, I remember Pastor Donovan would mention at Baptist missions and that's usually the nightmare of uh, missionaries is like, uh, or people when they give out a testimony or report to Bible Baptist Church is that, okay, here's an example of a bad missionary letter. Here's a, a good example of a good missionary letter. I go, oh my, I was like, oh my word, I'm not sending a missionary letter to Bible Baptist Church, you know. <laughs> So then uh, he would mention, I'm not going to mention the names either, you know. <laughs> I feel bad for those brothers, you know. Uh, but he, uh, but you see, usually the bad letters that he mentioned are missionaries who describe their sorrow, their depression, and their misery, and then all about me, me, me. And then the, the Pastor Donovan goes, that is not a good missionary letter. And he's like, this, this is not what people want to hear. And then he says, people want to hear about what you're accomplishing, what you're actually doing for the Lord. Now, it's important that people know your struggles so we know what to pray for, right? But at the same time, it's got to, when Paul mentions about his struggle, it, he says it's done to what at the last part of verse 22? Comfort their hearts. It's to comfort them. Isn't it comforting to know about what we've been praying for, about a missionary struggle has been finally answered, or the Lord's been uh, making ways for them? Especially during the coronavirus time, it's so difficult. All right, let's finish this off. Verse 23, peace be to the brethren. All right, so usually Paul's closing of sal salutation after hammering them, <laughs> it's just like your preacher, during preaching and then at, at fellowship peace be unto you salutations <laughs> lord bless you how are you doing oh we missed you at church you know you know during preaching it's like where were you at church and then uh at salutation time oh we missed you at church it's kind of like that right <laughs> so uh always end in peace right in salutation so peace be to the brethren paul ends out is a lot of his epistles giving them peace to the brethren and love with faith. Now that's important. Uh, love with faith. Love with faith. So he's giving, he's not only uh, bestowing peace upon them, but he also wants them to have love uh, with faith. Love with faith. You might say, why is that? Because it is important that a church survives based on love. Now, uh, if you look at Revelation 2, which we won't turn to for time's sake, but we've looked at that passage quite often, so I'm not going to do it again. But in Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus, zealous for the Lord, did great works, but they uh, missed out their first love. They lacked love. You might say, why is that important? Because it's through love, and you remember at Ephesians I taught that? The root, what is the root? The starting point of everything. Knowing blue-blooded aliens. No! It's dispensationalism. It's important, but surprisingly, no. And believe it or not, it's not the infallibility of the King James Bible either. What starts the root of everything is love. Why? Because if you have a love for the Lord, then you're going to love truth. Then you're going to easily more condone the infallibility of the King James Bible issue and dispensationalism. And yes, even a hard doctrine like blue-blooded angels or something like that. I, I'm not, I mean, uh, that's a little bit, uh, I might be a little bit joking, but I'm actually being serious too. No matter if the doctrine is weak or strong or deep or simple, the point is, is that you're going to condone everything that book says once you really love the Lord. So that's the root of everything. And I'm not going to get into that because I, 
already emphasized so much on that in the previous chapters of Ephesians. But the idea I want to hit is faith here. Love with faith. You cannot love when there's no faith. You might say, really? Yeah, you try uh, not believing in God anymore during your trial and see if you really love him. No, then uh, usually people who lost their faith in God, that means they're bitter against God, right? Mm -hmm. Like the atheists, some people who became atheists, for example. Yeah. God forbid that they were a saved Christian to begin with. Who knows? Uh, not only that, it's the same thing with loving brethren. Uh, if you say, well, I really love the brother. No, if uh, you really love the brother, you trust them on something. That's faith, you know, relying on them on something. See, if you really trust the person, then the love would be much easier, isn't it? Uh, if you get married, you know what I'm talking about. You might say that you love your husband, you might love your wife, but actually when there are some trust issues, the love becomes much more difficult. But then when you start to learn to accept and trust each other a little bit more, a little bit more, then love becomes more matured and complete. Okay, continuing on. Now, this peace and love with faith comes from, obviously, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's important. So, there are, uh, notice, uh, there's, uh, these are two attacks against modalism. What is modalism? Modalism, basically, it's a false teaching that basically that God is only one person who takes on three different roles. So, basically... This one person, God, says, okay, I'm going to become the Son right here, and then I'm going to become the Father right here, and then I'm going to become the Holy Spirit right there. No, there, there are many cases like the baptism of Jesus. The three, uh, you see the three persons already presented there, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ getting baptized, the Holy Spirit as a dove, and God the Father speaking to him from heaven. See that? So we don't believe in uh, modalism. Uh, there's this uh, numbskull that we had who was singing Acts 2.38 in our church. And he was a mo full-blown modalist. And then he says, what is God's real name? I don't know if you ever heard that before. But modalist lying says, what is God's real name? And I go, uh, uh, I am that I am. And he goes, no, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he showed me this billboard. I was like, whoa, this guy is batty. But he pointed out, see, one person named Lord Jesus Christ. But it has... Uh, the, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Lord is representing the Father. Uh, Jesus is representing the Son. And Christ, which means anointed, is the Spirit. Now, he's right. Uh, it, it's a beautiful picture confirming the Trinity, Trinity, not modalism. But look at this one. Uh, if he wants to insist that way, then he's got a problem. At verse 23, God the Father and the what? All, all three beings over there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Then who's God the Father? Satan's grandma? Who's God the Father then? Oh my goodness. All right. Verse 24. I always like to close it like this. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And all God's people said. Amen. 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 Self-explanatory. Uh, grace be to all the people who love God. Who love the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you love him. You don't just say, I love him, like a bunch of false churches. A lot of false churches love Jesus. But is it done in sincerity? In sincerity. Sincerity means truth. Do they have truth? Or do they have error in doctrine? All right, let's, we finished Ephesians. All right. Uh, next, verse-by-verse verse Bible study. There'll be a surprise, all right? Let's close with a word of prayer. I pray today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And I also want to pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, the people will be blessed by the next uh, services and they'll be uh, have attentive ears and open hearts and that your Holy Spirit will move and that everything we learned from Ephesians, which is so important, Lord, one of the most important books for Christian doctrine today, that we'll apply it and actually practice them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.